so this isn't finished. I was expecting to have a bit more time to get the polished product done. So there's going to be a number of points in here that are like leading questions for you to go out and do your own research if, uh, if there are things that sound appealing to you. Uh, it assumes a base level of infrastructure knowledge and Kubernetes concepts. Um, the target audience for this was people running Kubernetes in production. Um, and it is not a comprehensive guide to security on Kubernetes. It's just, um, I guess, a collection of ideas and things that people can do to uh, improve their security posture and, you know, fix up any gaps that they might have in their own stacks. So start off with a uh, picture of Potato Dutton. Uh, so it's tip one is gonna stop the bots. And this is primarily about uh, using a web application firewall to kind of stop uh, malicious traffic at the edge of your stack. So, um, you know, there are a ton of bots out there just running scripts and trying to hit known vulnerabilities for every framework and, and application out there. So um, these types of things can just denial of service your site when you get hit by one of these bots just because it's hitting pages that are not cached and, um, and you know, it's like com computationally quite expensive. So the idea with a web application firewall is you can um, configure rules and um, when the traffic comes in the firewall checks or analyzes the request matches it against the rules that you have configured and if it hits then it blocks the request before it ever even comes to Drupal. So that can um, save you a lot of traffic and a lot of um, compute. So one thing that I think you know most people should do is set up your WAF to block common paths for other frameworks. So block your wp-admin.php, block your CGI paths, um, block your auto-discover stuff for, um, for those Microsoft products. Uh, so those are all like, you know, you know minimum uh, um, level of, of configuration required and you'll get, I think, quite a bit of value out of that. A lot of these WAF products also have um, managed rules so you know the there's like the OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities so you know there are most of them um, have some feature that you can turn on I want protection from the OWASP top 10 so that'll you know monitor for like a known set of exploits um, you know CSRF XSS and all those types of things uh, there's also I'm not 100% sure on what the status of this is I've tried to do some research the blogs are quite old but Drupal Steward, so this came out after the um, remote code execution exploit last year, maybe the year before. The idea was that it's a um, commercially supported WAF rule um, that, you know, when we have a big, you know, remote code exploit or something coming up in Drupal, um, behind the scenes, these WAF rules can be developed and automatically protect all of the Drupal sites that have Drupal Steward enabled. Um, so that's something that is super exciting concept. I'd love to know where it's at. Um, if anyone knows, please feel free to <laughs> give them, let me know at the end. Um, these are just, there are a lot of WAF products out there. They're usually the one that you're gonna choose is tied to the content delivery network that you already use. So, um, it, previous next and skipper we're using the aws waf product um, i have heard very good things about cloudflare's waf product there's a link there i'll put these slides up later but there's a link there to um, an excellent talk by sean hamlin at drupal south canberra and he goes into some serious depth about very cool features and and, um, and things that that product provides and if you're on gcp there's a lot of Kubernetes users are that Google has its own um, WAF product too, but I have not used that. Oh, There's meant to be text here. It's meant to say hydro bytes, hydro, no, hydro bits, hydro bytes. <laughs> okay, it's an older meme server that checks out. Um, so, yeah, talking about all things encryption here. So, um, 
First off, the rank is encryption at rest. So this is talking about um, stuff that is stored on disk. And, you know, when a machine is um, imaged or, uh, you know, someone gets access to the file system, you want to protect your data and make sure that, like, they can't just run off with your, you know, database volume or stuff that's in your private file system or your backups. So um, there's a, if you're using S3 in, in any capacity, we use S3 for our, our backup storage. Um, there's a few options. Um, Server-side encryption would be my recommendation. So this is just a, a, an option that you can enable on a bucket or like on a, on a um, backup utility to send a specific header with the S3 API requests. And, um, and that just makes sure that the stuff on disk at Amazon is encrypted with a KMS key. So the advantages of this is it's super easy to use. It's basically just a checkbox. Um, you don't need to manage keys yourself. And it, it does give you, in like from a um, SecOps perspective, like a pretty good level of protection. Um, the cons are that it might not satisfy the security requirements of your organization. So say you're, you know, you, maybe your organization doesn't like the risk of Amazon itself having the ability to decrypt the backups, then you might have to go to the other option, which is um, client side encryption. So this is where your application is the one that's um, actually doing the encryption and then pushing the encrypted blob to, uh, to your S3 bucket. Um, yeah, so the pros of that, it's flexible, it's portable. It doesn't have to just be S3. You can push it to Google or Azure's products. Um, but the cons are that the key management is all up to you. And please don't roll your own crypto. That's never a good idea. Just a few links there to ideas you can have if you want to roll with any of that. Um, at um, Previous Next and Skipper, we're using um, Elastic file system for our private and public storage. Um, that has, again, a checkbox that you can tick to have the, uh, the volumes on, you know, the underlying instances encrypted. That's a good idea to check. And RDS has the same option too. Again, checkbox and you're good to go. Okay, so now getting on to encryption in transit. So this is talking about TLS connections um, to protect data while it's going over the wire. Uh, unencrypted traffic, someone can sit on the network and just monitor the traffic and, and you know, if there's any sensitive data in there, take it and, um, and use it for nefarious purposes. Uh, there was a, m many years ago now, there's a great example, this um, Firefox plugin, I think called Firesheet. And you could go to like a, an internet cafe or like a you know, McDonald's and sit on their open Wi-Fi and just see all like these um, people logged into Facebook or, or Twitter and things like that. And it would give you an option to just say, oh, hey, Nick Santa is logged in on Twitter. Do you want to log in as him? And it would steal their session and you could post things as them. It was amazing. But anyway, if you've got encryption in transit, those types of attacks are mitigated. Um, in Drupal land, we've got connections coming into the app from the outside. So those are your browser saying, hey, I want to request index.php. Um, and the other type are Drupal making connections out. So um, in this context, we'll just cover ancillary services that are inside your cluster. So that might be Redis, Solar, Clam AV, things like that. So um, we're running on Amazon RDS for our, database image, our databases. And this is a really neat little um, couple of lines in settings.php that will encrypt your database connection. So Drupal talking to your database, fully TLS. Um, there's a blog post there where I go into more detail about how to set it up, how to um, add the keys to your container images or however else you run it. Um, so that's a really, low hanging piece of fruit that gives you just one extra hop that's encrypted. Um, so yeah, talking about the like incoming HTTP requests. So in a 
typical Kubernetes setup. This is kind of the bits that are encrypted are indicated with the ticks and the bits that are not encrypted are indicated with the cross. So this is not too bad. Like at the point at which your traffic hits traffic, it's inside the cluster. So at that point, you're only really worried about um, bad actors inside already the network perimeter. Um, but, you know, if you're running untrusted code or, um, you know, there are people who Uh, I've lost audio. Yeah, similar to me. Where did he go? Um, so, yeah, so at the point at which the traffic hits traffic, it's already inside your cluster. Um, but there are some instances where you might not fully trust everything in your cluster. I mean, no, you, you probably shouldn't ever fully trust anything inside your cluster because there might be bad actors who have managed to penetrate your network. So completing that last little hop there is, um, is important for protecting your customer's data when they're you know, submitting personal information or credit card details, things like that. Uh, it gets even worse when you look at when Drupal is then connecting out to other services for like your cache or search or AV scanning, um, typically none of those are encrypted, but they would potentially still be storing data that is sensitive and could be um, stolen or uh, yeah, used otherwise by an attacker. So um, there's a few options here. Um, I guess I'll go with the one on the right first. So the do it yourself, TLS um, for that first, um, for this like hop here where you're coming into Drupal. So you can set up a, um, an SSL certificate in front of Drupal here um, in, in that Drupal pod and um, have traffic connect over HTTPS. Now that's a, a quite a simple thing to do. It's, just, it's essentially the same thing as setting up SSL on a you know static uh, virtual private server like we used to do back in the day. Um, but it uh, only encrypts that one hop, that traffic coming into Drupal. It doesn't manage or doesn't like look after any of the other traffic then going out into your other services. Um, the kind of the more holistic and robust solution would be a service mesh. So a service mesh is um, a, a uh, it's like, it's, it's a description of a tool. There's a lot of products that do it. But essentially, it, um, that you can configure network policies and, um, and have certificates deployed to containers that get attached to every single pod inside of your cluster. Um, then when Drupal is talking to Redis or to Solar, it's not talking directly to the Redis pod. What it's doing is it's talking to its own little container that attached to itself as a proxy. And that proxy is talking to a proxy that's attached to the Redis pod. And so those two proxies talk over TLS, so that over the wire connection is encrypted. And then Redis and Drupal kind of don't even know that that's happening. Um, they, they're just fully, blissfully um, ignorant to the fact that they're like way more secure now. So the cons are, oh yeah, so the pros are that, that that manages everything. You know, you can configure any network connection inside your cluster to use a service mesh. The cons are that there's, you know, obviously it's a quite a complicated system to set up and maintain. Um, you do have additional um, latency added to your, to your hot path. You know, you've got extra TCP hops, you've got encryption of overhead um, and there is, like a, a non-negligible amount of additional compute resources that are running. Like all those proxies need CPU and need memory to be able to run. So that does kind of balloon out how many, um, how many nodes you're gonna need in your cluster to run. So these are some options for service meshes out there. Um, Linkerd and Istio are probably the two most popular ones. Uh, Istio is a, is deployed by default on GKE in Google, uh, and it is, it's a behemoth 
Linkerd is trying to go with the um, the more like turnkey type solution. So that's definitely one that like I personally would look at over Istio just so I don't have to understand a huge project to make it work. These other ones here like Consul and Kuma and Mesh are kind of newer um, on the scene and uh, probably wouldn't be deploying them into your production cluster just because things are moving pretty fast and uh, you know, yeah, they're basically still alpha or beta software. This is a excellent talk from um, the Kubernetes forum in Sydney from last year. And this guy is absolute gun and he goes into extreme depth and detail on all of those options and basically gives a breakdown of his recommendations for um, particular use cases and which service mesh to choose. All right, so on to the next topic. Um, so this is a, a tool that's relatively new called Open Policy Agent. So OPA um, is like a, a policy engine that allows you to um, set up rules. And when uh, a new object is created in the Kubernetes API, it validates those objects to make sure that they conform with your rule set. So cool things that you can do with this. Um, I mean, you could ensure that images that your pods are, you know, uh, have defined in their spec only come from a specific registry. Like you can, um, you know, use regex rules and things to say it can only come from, um, you know, skipper.io or something like that. Uh, you can ensure the images are configured to run as non-root users. You can ensure that, um, that host names, like if you've got a, uh, a team and they've got like uh, a specific subdomain inside your corporate domain that they're allowed to run wild with, um, you can make sure that anytime they create an ingress that it is inside that domain space. Uh, otherwise you could have people, you know, trying to create things um, where they shouldn't, like, you know, maybe they can accidentally deploy www and, um, and, and sit on that with a, a dev site, something like that. And it, it is like a, a, basically its own Turing complete programming system for these, um, these policies. So it's just options are limitless in, uh, in the types of rules that you can enforce. Now this type of thing is, in my opinion, is very important if your team is deploying with a tool like Helm, um, you know, where they can be quite, uh, they're free to basically run images from Docker Hub and, and things like that. There is a, there is a risk in, in running images like that. So yeah, definitely want to be having some guardrails around what they can do. This is an example of a policy. So this is what I mentioned first. Uh, it's basically checking that the name of the image starts with hooli.com as in trying to uh, make sure that images are only like hooli.com slash Drupal um, rather than docker.io slash Drupal. Okay, the next one is runtime monitoring um, and anomaly detection. So this is uh, a tool that monitors um, what's called the, the um, like syscalls on Linux. So, um, you know, all the really low level stuff that the kernel's doing um, is a tool called BPF, which can check what's going on. So this is kind of, again, another policy engine where you can um, set up alerts for specific things that look kind of wrong. So, um, you know, examples are, you, you know, unexpected processes, you know, uh, if someone, you know, um, managed to, manages to escape Drupal or PHP into a shell, you probably want to know about that. If someone manages to put a crypto miner on disk and run it, you probably want to know. Um, if someone manages to become root, probably want to know. Those are, you know, all examples of things that, um, that, that runtime monitoring can do. And, um, and there's stacks of other stuff. I'm not a real expert in this area, but um, it, yeah, definitely worth looking into. Uh, with Skipper, we're running Falco. So again, like all those things that I've mentioned are things that we're monitoring for. Um, and I believe that uh, Aqua has a similar tool. There may be others as well, but again, I'm 
not a real expert in this area. Okay, um, getting on to some simpler ones. Uh, Read-only file systems. So this is essentially stopping um, contained like files in the container from being modified. Um, so the benefits of this, <laughs> you can stop developers from, you know, um, jumping onto production and, and changing a file inside the container to fix the problem. Um, when, if they do that, they'll get a message saying, uh, permission to mark, denied, read-only container. Uh, and this, if you're running read-only containers, it really does defend against like many classes of attacks where um, an attacker can or is trying to write a file to disk or change index.php to then run arbitrary code. So if they get it, if you got a read-only file system, they can't do that. And it's um, it's just like you know, again, not saying you shouldn't patch a Drupal site, but if you know, it gives you that little bit of extra time um, and, and to, yeah, not have um, crypto miners being deployed on your infrastructure. This is an example of how you would define that in, uh, in your pod spec. So you can do this, you know, in your deployments or, or however else you're um, deploying your code. Okay, a couple of things around images. Um, so, Image vulnerability scanning is like a process that will scan your um, image files and identify um, like operating system dependencies that are vulnerable or your project dependencies that are vulnerable. Um, like these tools can be deployed in different ways. You can tell them to just scan everything inside your registry and identify things that are broken or out of date. Um, you can also put them into your CI CD pipeline. So, you know, uh, an interesting idea um, might be to have this at your, the end of your build process. And if there are any vulnerabilities, abort the build um, just to avoid deploying any vulnerable code. Uh, two options there to do this. I believe there are others. Um, yeah, definitely worth looking into. Okay, and the next one is image signing and notaries. So this is a, an approach to defend against an attacker um, somehow manages to get access to your registry, like they steal credentials or something like that. And they push an image with um, some kind of uh, exploit or you know some sort of arbitrary code that they wanna run. And they push it into a registry that you, kind of just implicitly trust. You know, so your, your, wherever your Drupal code, your Drupal um, images are going, they just push a crypto miner to that. And, um, you know, when your Kubernetes cluster pulls that image, it doesn't know that it's meant to be Drupal. It just goes, oh, yeah, the image is there, cool, runs, and um, the crypto miner's running instead of Drupal. So what this approach says is that when you build your image, um, you cryptographically sign it, and you send that um, signature to what's called a notary. And the notary remembers that. And it associates that with a specific image version. You then have um, Portieris running on your Kubernetes cluster. And when Kubernetes pulls the image, it checksums the image, tells the notary, hey, I've got this checksum. Does it match what you have? If it does, good. It runs it, no problem. If it doesn't, it won't run the image. So that's just a, um, a, you know, defending against that particular vector. Cool, and that was it. Thank you. Any questions? Comments? Thanks, Nick. That was great. Uh, yeah, I have a question, or I guess a comment around Drupal Stewart and um, I guess the there it is a bit contentious if like the these if large hosting companies are getting like firewall rules before 